Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in studio with my co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey now, Jimmy. The intrepid investigative reporter, Scott yeah. Bernstein. Uh, we're super excited for today's episode. Uh, we are joined by Carter Smith, Dr. Carter Smith, who is a, uh, a retired U.S. Army CID special agent. He is also a professor of criminal justice at Middle Tennessee State University. And I met uh, Dr. Smith a few years ago when I was doing my training at the National Gang Crime Research Center in Chicago. And um, I was just really influenced by his research and I've incorporated it into my own classes and lesson plans. So once we started the podcast, this was something, a, a goal of mine for a long time now was to have him on our podcast. And uh, we're, we're happy to have him here. Uh, yeah, welcome, uh, Dr. Smith. Mr. Smith, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And so so the one of his specializations and one of the things we want to talk about is his his book that came out a few years ago, Gangs in the Military, Gangsters, Bikers and Terrorists with Military Training. And this was the, the, the class that he taught that I that I was studying under him in Chicago so that's going to be the main subject of today's discussion, uh, gangs in the military and, and his expertise. Before we turn it over to uh, Dr. Smith, I called him Mr. Smith. I apologize. Mr. Smith, not going to was, Washington here. We got Dr. <laughs> Smith coming to Detroit via Zoom <laughs> yeah, to talk I've to been, us about gangs in the military. I've been called that by students, and I don't take it personally. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll just give a, a quick precursor to this conversation or preamble that I think one of the things that we're really proud of uh, at the Original Gangsters podcast uh, is that we find, you know, layers and nuance and context to the, you know, the blood and guts that everybody that gets sensationalized, that the stuff that you you see in movies or you see uh, splashed across your front page or your newspaper, which is fine and dandy. And I'm not saying that I'm not interested by that because I am, but I think these kind of conversations and these kind of guests where we're getting into like the nook, the nooks and crannies and, yeah. and, and exposing and highlighting aspects of organized crime that people either don't know or don't know a lot about, or, um, you can, you, you don't know what you don't know. And you yeah. wouldn't necessarily think when you talk about the military, that there would be a big gang presence, but there is much more of a organized crime influence and, and we can kind of break that down and define what that means in the U S military than I think the average U S citizen would could, could ever dream of. Yeah. That's why I think this, this topic is, is so important. So, um, Carter, tell us about how, how did you first get interested in this, uh, this topic and then we'll, then we'll focus more on your specific, uh, research, but just in general, how did you get interested in this? I, f I first came across the military training of gang members or the connection between gangs and the military in the very early 90s, uh, 91, 92. I was being proactive in my criminal investigations with another uh, agent or investigator. And we were, we were investigating a rash of parking lot break-ins on Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And we realized that not unlike today, people left their cars in parking lots with important stuff in them and then were, oh my God, shocked that somebody came, grabbed their unlocked door, reached into their car and stole their put, put name of, of expensive item in here. At the time, I think it was DVDs or maybe CD players or whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, pocketbooks and the like, now it's guns. Or haven't we progressed? Um, but anyway, we decided to do a little bit of proactive work, police work, and we went to parking lots and we would pull on door handles we would pull up on door handles or push in buttons. I remember we had to figure out which it was before you do it. Otherwise you'll jerk the knob off or the handle off and you actually actually did that. Uh, but we would stick notes inside the cars, uh, kind of like a warning note. It was official and we had them all printed up and we quit when we, when we handed out a hundred that, that night. And we would stick a note in there saying, and then we would lock the door behind it. We would say it was something along the lines of, uh, we, we got into your car, lucky for you, we're the police, and we left this note and locked it behind it. Something similar. To that. that was the message. Um, we did that for a few nights on a, a few different days of the week, and I'm, I never forget, on a Thursday night, we were in one of the larger parking lots on post, and we saw that we weren't the only people who were grabbing doorknobs and pushing buttons. And so we took our badges, showed them to the other two, and asked for their badges, and they said, you know, we don't have no stinking badges, uh, <laughs> or, or something like that. 
Uh, so we showed them our handcuffs and we took them to the police station and we asked them what they were doing. Long story short, they said they were in the, I don't remember what it was, gang. Um, and we paid attention to that because last time I checked, a gang is nothing more than a, an organization that meets the criminal code for conspiracy. Um, and so we're two or more, three or more, whichever, you know, however you want to go by it. Um, people agree to commit a crime and one does something in the furtherance of it, you have a, a conspiracy. Well, we had that, but we figured we'd dig a little deeper into it. And we realized that this was, there was a group, the, the group that we stopped was, was uh, family members of military service members who were affiliated with a gang that had popped up off uh, into Clarksville, which is the Tennessee side of Fort Campbell. Um, so we investigated, got a little bit interested in, talked to police uh, officers on both sides of the state line. Fort Campbell dissects basically Tennessee and Kentucky state line. We talked to some folks in Kentucky, some folks in Tennessee, very little recognition of gangs. This was the early 90s. There wasn't a gang problem, even if there was a gang problem, because they didn't have a solution. Uh, we got to Nashville and Louisville. We had more of an indication. So we started gathering information and we did what I think just about any startup gang investigator team does. We would learn stuff, we would collect it, and then we would share it. And we'd share it with uh, obviously other law enforcement agencies in the local area, but then we shared it with the non-commissioned officers and officers in, in the military. We basically would say, here's some signs that your soldiers might be in a gang, whether it's street gang, domestic terrorist group, outlaw motorcycle gang, we don't care because it's an affiliation that's contrary to the military, uh, please let us know if you see any of these indicators. And so we just started collecting that information. And before too long, people were asking us to stop fishing and teach them how to fish. So what, in, based on your experience, um, if you could tell us about what are some of the other prominent gangs that you find represented in our the, the different branches of the military right now? I mean, I know what they are because I study your research. I teach yeah, about it, but yeah. just for for our audience, what what would uh, you know? Now that you're an expert on it, what are you finding? Well, the the short answer is every major criminal gang, whether it's a street gang or an outlaw motorcycle gang, or the military, and uh, starting in well until 2012, lumped them all into a category. But domestic terrorist extremists were also incorporated into that. Now, with the recent shift, uh, they've actually. I just got the 2020 report. They're a little delayed in their in their responses to FOIA requests, um, and they had had removed all evidence of any domestic extremists as of 2020. Wow. So I don't know if COVID took that out or no, I don't, I'm joking. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I, I've just requested 21 and 22, and we'll see how that comes about. But every major street gang and every major outlaw motorcycle gang has been represented in the military at one time or another, and I dare say I put a paycheck to paycheck that they're still in this very moment, there's a representative if we were if we were to find truthful responses. The most recent report that I'm looking at right now has, for example, the Four Corner Hustlers, the Eight Trade Gangsters, the Conservative Vice Lords, the Black Gangster Disciples, the Bloods, the Crips, uh, uh, MS-13, Vatos Locos. Uh, I'm just calling off the big ones, sure. not even, you know. Um, you know, Carter, I believe- United Blood Nation and the West Coast Crips. Carter, I believe that in the last couple months, my, my memory is just being jogged, but because I am someone that uh, studies the gangster disciples pretty heavily and right. I'm in, in contact with a lot of uh, federal law enforcement out of Chicago because that's the gangster disciples headquarters. That's right. where they were founded. Um, but in the last 30, 40 years or 35 years, they've expanded greatly around the country and Yep. They are definitely sprinkled in quite a bit uh, into the military. I believe in the last couple months there was a bust, uh, I think, down in Atlanta of Gangster Disciples. And I, I just my my numbers might be a little fuzzy, but I believe, like, there were 12 indicted and, like, eight of the 12 were active military. Would, wouldn't surprise me. I mean, just recent, well, in the past couple of years, uh, there have been con uh, cases, I don't know that it was convictions, but they're definitely charges. Uh, I just talked to uh, one of the Chicago stations here recently um, about Fort Campbell soldiers uh, doing straw purchases, basically, of guns and taking them up to Chicago because 
because Chicago gangsters can't get their guns from anywhere else for Pete's sakes. Uh, but <laughs> the the soldiers out in uh, out in Colorado have done the same thing in the past. The gangster disciples, for for as your example, uh, they may not be the biggest gang, but they are two things that I know of. They are number one, the most populated in the military of aware members of gangsters. In other words, if you if you go through and talk to people who've come across gang gang members in the military, I dare say the gangster disciples would be at the top of their list numerically speaking. Mm-hmm. Number two, they're one of just a handful of third generation gangs that that Sullivan and Bunker talked about. I don't know if you you or your listeners are familiar with those. Third generation gangs to me aren't it's not it's not uh, father, grandfather, son, anything like that. It's it's iterations or evolutions of gangs. It's they've been around so long that they aren't limited, obviously, to Cook County, Chicago, yeah. that they aren't limited to the, the state boundary of Illinois. Hell, they are not limited to the Canadian border, nor the Mexican border, nor the continent, nor nothing else. And there's only a handful of those. And, and, and honestly, it's them and the vice lords. And it's not the Bloods and the Crips. Yeah. And so these are corporate Mata Salvatrucha and uh, uh, 18th Street are the only other four that are typically in North America. And there was only a handful of them that these guys identified. Sullivan and Bunker, they do the um, Small Wars Journal, among other things, the one one segment of the Small Wars Journal. Anyway, um, I looked at that and it was like, okay, so this answers a lot of questions that nobody's asking. For example, why don't we know what gangsters are doing in the military? Well, because they're smart enough to know how to wear their freaking colors under their uniform, right? Because they know that, that when they used to tat their or put a little tat above their eyeball, or or if they used to cut little swipes in their in their in their right eye or right eye, uh, whatever it is that eyelash, yeah, uh, or the or the, or the left eye or the, whatever they they used to bang right or left or, or throw down certain numbers or tat this or tat that seven four two and they, people figure that out the cops figure that out they decide they crack the code. And they figure out how to do it, and they share that with folks. So the gangsters said, "You know what? It's like the OMGs doing soft colors. Yeah. Let's just go blank now. We'll wear white T-shirts, and and, and everybody else knows who we are. It's like shirts and skins yeah. for a basketball game." I mean, I, I, this is this, this is a small digression, but I, I'm wondering if if Carter Smith, who's an expert on this, uh, recognized what I'm about to throw out there. Uh, Super Bowl halftime show, <laughs> Snoop Dogg. Yeah, the Crips was clearly, <laughs> clearly representing the Crips. Yeah, in yeah. that um, in that halftime show, and you know his excuse was that he was you know was repping the L.A. Rams colors, but in reality, you know there was no doubt Snoop was going to roll out uh, in front of tens of millions of people, uh, if not more, uh, repping the the blue colors of the Crips, which he is, you know, repped uh, since he was a young man. Actually, went on trial for murder. Um, related to uh, a gang-related homicide that he was acquitted of. But did you notice that when you were watching the Super Bowl or if you were watching the Super Bowl? Yeah, I, I, I watched that. I don't think he was the only celebrity doing that, by the way. I think he had a posse. Yeah. Uh, strategically placed. I, yeah. I'll just I'll put it to this way. I think the Bloods, the Crips, the gang, well, the leadership of the Gangster Disciples, the Vice Lords, the Matasavatrucha, and 18th Street to an extent, because their their home base is back home in, in in Central America. But the large gangsters are are taking have taken solid notes from organized crime gangsters of a hundred years ago, and they've mixed that with the multimedia show that we put together today. So much so that I dare say they are no longer. I, I teach an organized crime class. I'll be teaching it this fall. I was going over my notes just to refresh because I, I like pondering things through the summer leading up to that so I can point out things like you just did for the for the students to think, oh, that's, yeah, that makes sense. And, I, and one of the main disclaimers that I start on is, look, the course may be called organized crime, but I want you to think of this as organized business mm-hmm. because but for that thought of the criminal act stopping me and you from doing it, these guys think way back. These aren't dumbass idiots. Sit, can I say that? Yeah. On the, sit on the back of a pickup truck or a low rider. They're not knuckle draggers. Smoking a smoking a blunt and 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 hurting themselves with a knife because they don't have anything better to do. No, these are geniuses who won't use their own product, but they're selling the hell out of fentanyl 
and meth and coke and all this other good stuff, and they're smart enough to never mess a piss test because they work for the state or the federal government, for Pete says. Mm -hmm. These are brilliant people who just happen to commit crime. And that was the part that when, when I started realizing the GDs were third generation and they were all saturated in the military, that's when I realized that street, local cops got no chance of identifying these guys if the military hasn't already. Because local cops, I'm not saying there's, they, they don't do their job. I'm saying these guys are going to be so far, they're going to be more removed from, from any killing or anything else than Hoover is in his, in his prison in Colorado. So, yeah, so Larry, I, yeah, Larry Hoover, the leader, founder of the Gangster Disciples, has been in prison since 1973. Yeah, uh, for, a, for, for most of his followers. Yeah, first degree homicide. The group yeah. was founded in 66, 67 uh, by him and David Barksdale. And, uh, you know, without question, Larry Hoover, if we're talking about street gangs in America, the single most prominent, prolific street gang boss, without question, is Larry Hoover. Sure. Uh, sure. And I think it also speaks when we're talking about the infiltration of the U S military it's, you know, and playing off of what Dr. Smith just said about how these guys are, you know, criminal masterminds and you don't necessarily give them enough credit, but Larry Hoover. And I think this, again, this speaks to the organization as a whole. Larry Hoover has been running that group since night or since the 1960s. He's been running it from a prison cell since 1973. <laughs> Right. And instead of getting weaker, the group has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger and more right. widespread and more intertwined into legitimate business and parts of the government. So, you know, if if they're able to keep that organization as buttoned up and focused and diversified as they have, and the guy that's the ultimate shot caller, like uh Dr. Smith pointed out earlier in the show, Larry Hoover's locked up 23 hours a day yeah. in, in, in Supermax uh, in Colorado. Right. It just shows you like, and the, and the government believes right now because he is the target of an active federal racketeering case right now, as we speak, spring of 2022, that this guy could have done everything or this organization would become everything that it became with this one person that's the, 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 the master puppeteer being locked up for over almost 50 years. I mean, it just speaks to, to the um, resiliency, I guess, of the gangster. Well, it reminds you of the Italians with like guys like Carmine Carmine Persico. Persico, that same thing. They're lifers, exactly. and yet they're still calling the shots behind. Right. <laughs> but you went from an organization that when Larry Hoover and David Barksdale started it, you had a couple hundred people. Now their estimates are that the Gangster Disciples are, you know, number well over 25,000 across the country. Yeah. That's, you know, that's and, impressive. And in, in addition to that, this also, and I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a myth buster by training, but I do, whenever I see one glaring, I, 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 I call it out. I, I started in, in the early 90s when we started seeing this gang thing. I said, OK, but I got to I got to know where I'm going to start and where I'm going to stop. And having been a juvenile delinquent myself, I got called out on one by one of my childhood friends who read the book, The Gangs in the Military Book. He said, wait a second. You were a juvenile delinquent. We were friends. What does that make me? I said, one of my <laughs> co-conspirators, you know, but but I don't waste my time trying to figure out how to fix juvenile gangsters. They either fix themselves or they graduate. Like, and and I and I I'll, again, my students, they're 18 to 25. Typically, I, I walk them through this in their memory. Do you remember when you turned 18 or do you remember when you realized you were 18? It's the same feeling. It just might be a little bit of a delay on day 18. If you do something that's beyond stupid, you can be arrested and you don't get a second chance. You are now an adult young man or young woman, and you are going to pay the price. And you know, every gangster that's a Jew, that's a, a youth gang member or a juvenile gang member, they go through that process. I don't care how long, I don't care why they joined the gang. They joined it because they need family. They join it because they need hugs. They join it because they ain't got their ass beat enough in high school. They join it for whatever reason or love or, 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 and then on day 18, 
they have a revelation. They're like, okay, now I might have been doing some bad stuff, but this is zero day for the rest of my life. I'm an adult. I don't even start caring about whether they're gangsters until then, because that's a career move, because mm-hmm. that's a sellout, because that's going forward, not saying, oh, I might go back to my non law abiding or to my law abiding self. I, I might I might shift gears. I might be fixable. I might be trainable. I might. No, dumbass. You just graduated. Welcome to the park. You can either get out or you can. I mean, when 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 pulling levers came in and they started targeting above above 18 people, it was like, dude, you better start at 16 and 17. See if you can get a track record by threatening them with incarceration. That's what the goal is. Where do you get off? How would you? Uh, we're going to threaten you with what you're looking for, because yeah. then you can spend, make a lot of money in Cook County Prison. Yeah, so, that yeah. that's something I talk about with my students. Uh, but can, with with yeah, go no, ahead. go on. We finish. I was going to say that with in some cases, to be incarcerated is gives you some street credit because it it first of all it proves that you can you're tough enough to handle it, but it also proves that you're not a snitch. Right. When guys yep. have not been incarcerated, all of a sudden people start to wonder, why isn't why isn't so and so never they never get pinched? You're and, a snitch for a cop. Right. You're maybe they're a cop. right. Yep. So so if you do some time, that proves that not only you're a tough guy, but you're not you're not cooperating in, in some form. So, yeah, some of the dudes, young dudes, like it's it's like a rite of passage to, yep. you know, get pinched. And how do, do you some con- time. how do you connect that to what we see in the military? I mean, do you see guys that are 18-year-olds or 17-year-olds that that get in front of a judge and the judge is like, you're either going to prison or you're going to, to the military. Day. They go to the military, but in some ways, it's the same thing as going to prison. To to this day. And I'll tell you, that that was known to be done around Vietnam time. I, yeah. came, I came in the Army right after Vietnam, and that was a known and accepted thing up until that time. And then for some reason, it wasn't. I think it's because we went to an all volunteer army, but that's, that's just my, that's just my guess. But we still have judges in our larger areas, especially, and some in our rural areas who will tell a young man, it's the army or it's the military. And sometimes they'll pick a Marine. It doesn't matter. Whoever's low on, on, on numbers, they will call the recruiter. I, I, I've got stories of folks showing up to basic training and getting handcuffs, taking off, taken off. <laughs> Uh, wow, you know, but are the, but are those some of the people that are bringing the the gang atmosphere well, into the military? To, to, to be complete in that thought, the vast majority of people who join the military in order to get out of the gang succeed as best as I can tell. But the vast majority isn't who I'm concerned with, and I'm concerned with the small number that don't, and I'm concerned with the small number that only were a, a, a associates or just in, slightly interested in the gang until they got in the military and they realize it's not a full-time job after all. It's like, oh, maybe a nine or 10 hour a day job unless we're deployed and even then you get time off. And then all this extra time, I could use my brain and stuff. And then years down the road or maybe days, weeks or months, there be, might be a former gang affiliated person meeting with another former gang affiliated person and they get that knowing look, right? And it's like, wait, where was you? Where would where did you serve? Right, air quotes. Well, I was uh, rolling sixties neighborhood crip. Oh no, shit! I was a I was a deuce, uh, a five deuce, whatever. They could be in rival gangs that on the street would kill each other, but the bond between those two just became tighter in an instant than anything else on the planet. That and the military connection, and they they're, they're going to own it. And the dumbass lieutenant that's in charge of them, he thinks he taught them loyalty. What? Are you kidding me? No, no, dude. You had nothing to do with that. Go back to West Point. Yeah, that, that's it. So what types of crimes do we, in your research, you, you've already mentioned, um, you know, auto theft, you know, kind of petty theft, larceny. What are some of the other crimes that you're documenting? Um, because because someone could say, oh, well, there's gangs in the military, but if they're if they're not doing anything wrong, well, based on your research, they, they continue their Organized criminal I'd, I'd activities. Guess, I'd guess drugs play a big role in it. Drug, yeah, it's been said by the FBI, who may or may not know, but eighty uh, percent of the crimes in America are, are eighty percent of the drug crimes in America have a gang connection. I don't know that that changes in the military, y'all. I, I, 
I can't imagine. Now, I will tell you that one of the things the military has gotten really, really good at it is downplaying the impact of gang members on the military. They say, well, it's less than X percent or whatever like that. These are the same people, and they're, they're talking about for law enforcement reports. It's, it's a felony report that's got a certain amount of, 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 uh, of juice attached to it, and they count those and they say, well, it's, it's below 5%, it's below 2% or whatever. They're the same ones that will count a piss test as an actual report. So don't talk to me about there's no gang affiliation. There, I, I went to Scotland Yard for crime scene managers course many years ago, and I learned a phrase that is, it should be used more in, 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 in normal conversation, but it's real basic. You don't look, you don't find. In 2003, 9-11 was over. 9-11 didn't cause the gangs to shut down. In 2003, a couple of congressmen asked per some prompting that maybe I may or may not have something to do with, but I know that folks that were deep into it, they said, hey, do we have a gang problem? There, were a, there was a murder in Germany and a murder in Alaska, and they reached out and they said, hey, do we have a gang problem in the military? Hell, we just looked in 95 after Timothy, Timothy McVeigh and some other things hit the fan. Why wouldn't we still be looking? Well, we stopped looking because of 9-11. So in 2003, we, lo- or, yeah, 2003, we looked back at the previous year, 2002, and when we weren't looking, we still found gang members. And then in 2004, when we looked at 2003 data, lo and behold, there was, but they hadn't been told to go look. They just realized that, oh, you asked for a report last year. I bet you can ask for a report this year. Let's go see if we can find something. (gasps) It was there. What do you know? Right? It hasn't gone away. This is every decade since before the United States was the United States. We've had military trained gang members on this continent. The oldest one, I found this, and you you may have seen it in the book. The oldest one was a captain in the Revolutionary War militia. (laughs) He he got a, a captain. He was a juvenile delinquent in Philadelphia. He got out of the military and he became a river pirate. Yeah. And I don't mean, I don't mean, you know, blimey, there we go, Johnny Depp <laughs> kind of stuff. I'm talking this dude up and down the, or excuse me, left to right on the Ohio and up and down the Mississippi. He was killing people for their property so he could take it down to New Orleans and sell it. Because that's where people were going from the Northeast down to New Orleans. And then he got smart. He must have had an advisory council. He got smart and he decided to stop at the bottom of the Natchez Trace. He said, why should I steal their property and sell it? Old time fences, right? They, I'll give you 10, 10 cents on a dollar. He said, I'll just wait till they sell it and I'll get all their money. Yeah, Brilliant strategy, especially the Natchez Trace that doesn't have any kind of law enforcement any more than the Ohio or the Mississippi did. So it's not it's not gone away. And that's the problem that I that I see is I got commanders who I, I don't want to tell people I have a gang problem. Dude, you didn't create this monster. You didn't create the, the environment that they, 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 they grow like that in. It's a poison or it's a cancer. You can treat it either way you want to. Or you can treat it like dog crap. You don't want to eat it. You don't <laughs> want to consume it, right? But if you didn't create the problem, go find out who did. Fix the solution, not the symptoms. Where, where, do, where do the outlaw biker gangs play in this milieu of military so numer- gang gang? Numer- gang affairs ba- basically they're parallel because federal law calls them the same thing as street gangs it's the wildest thing uh and they kind of connect um outlaw motorcycle gang members even when the military and i when i say military i'm talking about all the branches but army cid where i was they're the reigning champion for lack of a better term because everybody else is smaller than they are and they all point to them out oh, go ask cid it's like why they don't know nothing but when they re- when they have reported intentionally looked to gang to, to report on outlaw motorcycle gang members, they haven't found but a fraction of what they found with street gangs not looking. It's the craziest thing. Now, it's a numbers game for starters. There are more clearly more street gangs members. Yeah, outside than, than there are outlaw bikers. Than there are outlaws. But could the could the outlaws be dangerous? Yeah. Here's the other thing. Until just recently, until the 2020 report. They would always say that the majority of outlaw motorcycle gang members are old white dudes. Well, they didn't use those terms. That, that's that's, that's they, a false narrative, but yeah. No, and, and this year they actually realized, oh, no, wait, there's more black guys on bikes now. Holy crap. It's Neither of those are true. Yeah. What they mean to say is 
when we weren't really looking, this is what we stumbled across. What it means is you have a bunch of rookies, but the, the old white guys are senior NCOs. I don't know how they got caught. I think they got cocky or confident, maybe had one more reenlistment, and they couldn't get kicked out unless they committed a felony or something like that. But all they're, they're not gauging what's existing. They're gauging what they come across, and they're not looking. So why would they, most of them, why would they be, why would they claim it as fact? Well, but the outlaws, the ahead. outlaw gang, to, to answer your question, every outlaw motorcycle gang but the outlaws was formed after World War II. But every large, every every one of the big outlaw motorcycle gangs, but the pagans, as I recall, were started by veterans. Mm -hmm. Right. I was going to say, let's let's make a like a correlation. Let's do a historical through line, though, here, because right. the explosion of the outlaw biker culture was in the years after Vietnam. And right. you had a lot of those outlaws, pagans, hell's angels in Detroit highwaymen. Right. Uh, warlocks, um, and so forth that were built. I mean, the, the foundation of those groups were built on ex military. Right. And the, and the loyalty that comes with that and the camaraderie and, and, and all the thing, all the bonus points in the military, you had that. And, and now they aren't even waiting till they get out to, to fly colors. And I'd now be going up the soft colors. They're putting t-shirts on that are the right color underneath their uniforms. But it's the same game. I'd be interested to, to see numbers right now with, over the last 20 years, guys that are coming out of serving in Iraq, serving in yeah. Afghanistan, how many of those guys gravitated to, to outlaw, yeah. micro, uh, outlaw biker groups. I mean, I can speak from my research. Uh, most of my, my biker reporting is here in Detroit. I do a little bit of uh, pagans uh, out of Philadelphia. Yeah. But... Uh, I know from my research here that there is a a very vocal, definitive younger generation. Yes, that is being, you know, guys that are in their twenties and thirties that are being groomed by the OGs that are in their sixties and seventies, and it, it's not it's it's different than the Italian mafia. I've okay. noticed I've noticed in the Italian mafia in the last twenty years. You have a lot less of a recruiting pool, but right. I don't, I, I obviously don't have analytics on this or any metrics on this, but just the eye test when I've been around biker clubs and been, I mean, I've, I would, I don't know if, if it, it was, a, if it's an honor or a privilege, but I, I've had some interactions with big time bikers here in Detroit, um, right. being introduced to, to presidents and being invited to the clubhouse. And I, I noticed that there, it wasn't just a bunch of old white guys with beards. Right. I mean, nor is the, nor is the yeah. VFW, not that there's any bikers in the VFW, but you get my point. Yeah. And, and we've got more veterans of different ages now. And specifically, I think this, when I, the anecdote I'm about to give, I think plays into what we're talking about with gangs in the military. It's not a direct correlation, but I think there is a correlation there. I'm not going to name the, the biker group or the biker boss, but right. I, I sat with a very, very big biker boss of a very, very big gang who said to me, we're all about stealth now. We're not going to be out there with our beards and our tattoos and our colors. And, and this guy was put in as president to start that shift. And if you right. looked at, the, if I brought this guy, I don't know what he looks like now, but I, you know, I met him five years ago or six years ago. If I brought that guy five or six years ago in front of you, you would have had no idea that this guy was a biker boss and it was intentional. Yeah. So a, um, speak on the, on the, on the topic of OMG. So Jimmy may have met the guy that introduced me. He's out of, uh, over in Pennsylvania, um, introduced me. Did he introduce? Yes. Um, introduced me to a leader in one of the big, the big five. Um, and then I met him on another occasion. Uh, but when I, when I met him in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, we went out and had dinner. And as you can imagine, you know, anybody that you, 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 you try to connect with them and it's like, okay, here I am 20 something years, veteran military, da, da, da. And this guy, no military, uh, biker, about the same age. 
and we hit we didn't hit it off because that would be you know unacceptable i'm just kidding um <laughs> but but i we both realized that we were having ease of conversation and i mentioned it and i said you know i said but and i i, I put it in context <clears throat> i said you know i had a brother-in-law that i don't talk to now because he's a bad influence on everybody who breathes the same air as i said but when he started dating my sister-in-law i realized that I was so glad we didn't grow up together because both of us would have been in, in jail, not just him. And I said, I get the same vibe from you. It's like, I, you know, I'm glad we're more mature having met the first time because I think we could do some danger. And <laughs> I would probably have been the one hang out, hung out to dry. And he said, well, that's because of what we have in common. And I didn't think of it that way. I love it when somebody else throws a different perspective. I said, what do you see that we have in common? He said, we're both warriors at heart. That's a great anecdote. Right? I said, oh yeah, you just stripped all the crap away and you went right to the core. Yeah, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, I, was a, I was a criminal investigator and they offered me to go to, to, to college full time. I was like, wait, 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 wait. I don't, number one, too good to be true. But number two, I'm gonna, I love investigations. I was doing drug work. I was doing all, white crime, white collar crime. I was doing a variety of, I may miss that too much. Oh no, I did a ton of research. And you know what? Your hands stay a lot cleaner and your, your mind is just as challenged. I went to law school. I went to work as, as a law clerk while you're in school because that's what they do. They actually hired me for my investigative skills. And they just paid me as a law clerk. So I was <laughs> broke. But one of the one of the guys in there had worked for the DEA and there was another cop in there, both lawyers now. And they were joking with me, called me, called me aside and said, hey, Carter, just so you know, you ain't going to find it. What are you talking about? And they jerked me around a little bit like, well, you ain't going to find it. Why are you even bother looking, you know, like that? What am I looking for that I ain't going to find? The adrenaline rush. Mm. What do you mean the adrenaline rush? You know, when you're interviewing a guy and you've been in there for an hour and a half and you know he's lying and you know he knows he's lying and you know he knows he, you got him into a corner. And you're about looking for that shoulder shrug and that sigh. Or maybe you're doing a drug deal and you know you just gave the signal and that whatever it is that you get that you won't find that practicing law well fast forward i'm not practicing law i'm teaching college with my law degree and a variety of other things that wasn't why but i it's it's these are transferable skills and that's bring that back to my my earlier comment about but for that whole criminal thing uh george knox the the uh, director of the national gang crime research center about the time I was seeing the problems in Fort Campbell in the early 90s, had a survey done of National Guard soldiers in the Chicago area. And one of the questions he asked them is, and to put this into perspective, you know the, the, the term ducks when used about gang members, right? If it walks like a duck, talks right. like a duck, quacks like it must be a duck. I actually found out who who originally said that. When you're in academic writing about stuff, you actually have to find the original source. Um, anyway, I, I, I would say that he was interviewing duck experts, right? These are people in and around South Side of Chicago. They know what gangsters are, right? And they were asking them. Uh, he was asking them a variety of questions, but the most poignant question was. Do you think that the gang leaders that you know that are in the military would do well in any field doing anything? And oh, overwhelmingly, absolutely. It's a mm. transferable skill set. You just have to have that integrity piece. And if you're missing that, it depends on what, you know, who you're who you're backstabbing or who you're undermining or whatever. So that, yeah. that covers all the groups. Yeah, I mean, I think um if, based on my research, um especially with outlaw bikers, why they, they may feel comfortable is um, when they, when they're, um, you know, they come home and they're, they're missing that, um, there's no war to fight, right? Right. There's no, yeah, right. There's no, they're missing hell, that, there's that no action. hell to go, uh, commandeer. There's right. no, and, th and then the other irony, which, which I think why they, they're so comfortable in the, in the outlaw biker culture is on, on the one hand, you get that adrenaline rush. And as you were talking about, there's, there's a part of its attitude, like being the warrior, but yep. also ironically, even though they're outlaws, the biker clubs are very hierarchical and a lot of rules and yeah. regulations and i think that so some call, of the military guys feel feel comfortable they feel comfortable in that environment that's because, why they call uh, <laughs> chapter meetings church right right so yeah. so like that that idea that idea 
they've already been indoctrinated by that in the military that um, there's rules and regulations and protocols. And so it's ironic that the outlaw bikers on the streets, they're hellraisers, but within their own organizations, it's very much about it's following just, the just, rules. Very, it, it, for, very a group, for a group that I've always said, or outlaw bikers in general, uh, my, my research, my personal exposure factor tells me that these guys are the fringe of the fringe, yes. which, which is interesting when you reconcile that with the fact that the groups themselves yes. are quite disciplined. Yes, right. In terms of their hierarchy, I'm I'm interested to to throw this out uh, throw this out to you, Doctor Smith, because it's you know bubbling in my head as we're having this conversation, and uh, it it literally just crystallized in the last couple minutes. Perfect. So, I don't know if you're aware, but the pagans uh, are in the midst of an expansion effort that is known as the Blue Wave, okay. uh, a term that was coined by uh, the godfather of the pagans uh, from about 2017 to last summer, uh, known as Conan the Barbarian. Keith Richter, out of New York City, or sorry, out of Long Island. Um, for people that don't know the pagans, it's a group that's normally been led out of Pennsylvania, either uh, Pittsburgh or, Pen or, or Philadelphia. For a while, I think it was led out of Virginia. It was founded in Maryland, but those are the main areas. So Richter came in, uh, took power by force in a bloodless coup, uh, mm. in the end of 17. And when he, I think around Christmas, new years of 17, he held a meeting and he announced that we are going to take the country by storm. And in the last four years, there's been about 15 to 20 new pagans chapters opened in areas that pagans have never been in before. Um, they're, they're moving West and Southwest. Um, and there has been violence that has followed them. Uh, a shooting in Texas last year, uh, a murder um, in, uh, in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. So my question to you is, and this is what was percolated in my head. It seems that if you were Conan the Barbarian or you were the person that was um, igniting this expansion effort, it might, it might be a smart move to use the military as a way to expand your reach, right? Because if you're in the military, you're going to be Everywhere. dispatched yeah. to – right. Uh, different uh, military bases around the country. We just found out that the pagans uh, a couple months ago, we just found out the pagans have chapters now in Oregon and Washington state. They had never moved that far yeah. West before. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about so, yeah, how they can export using the military to like network and export. Yeah. And I have no, I have no firsthand knowledge or even secondhand knowledge that they're trying to use the military. But as I'm thinking about it, others have, yeah. You think that that, that could be a, a, a card that they could play. Yeah. It, yeah, it easily could be. And they've got two different ways to do. Well, three, actually, they can put somebody in the military and tell them all those tats are meaningless. Tell the recruiter, all this other good stuff, kind of hard to do. It's easier to recruit people who've already got the military mindset and all that good stuff. They could also put them in as a husband of a female military member or what they seem to be doing a little bit more than that. And I've been, in the past three years, I'm in my second expert witness uh, work on, on, uh, um, for the military. Well, one four and one not so four. Um, but uh, I, they, as contractors, and the military law enforcement has started to look more at contractors, not that they're hunting, hunting for them, but when they see them, they at least write it down and report it to command. And when I get the, re the request that I fulfilled, I get to see them. Um, but I will tell you that I can't remember a year that I haven't seen the pagans in the list of OMGs or support clubs that are involved in criminal intelligence or law enforcement reports wow. in the military. Mm -hmm. um, and to add to that, since 2014, um, I, I realized Jimmy will like this as an, as a, as an academic. Um, our, our survey response rates are 
abysmal uh, and always have been, even before the Internet. Not that I go back that far, but I talk to people who, who do uh, or who did. Um, but I've always realized that I don't like surveys much either unless there's logic behind it. So starting in 2014, mind you, my dissertation wasn't until 2010. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, starting in 2009, technically, but but hard hard push since 2014. If a gang cop investigative unit or something like that calls me up and wants me to talk about military trained gang members, my response is yes. When is it? And how many people do you expect? And do you mind if I hand out a survey before I run my mouth? And they're like, oh, no problem. Send us a copy of it. Or yeah, that shouldn't be a, an issue. Uh, how about we go digital? No, digital sucks. I want to hand. I want to put a hard copy in their hand and make sure they have a pen. And then I'd like them to be on this on their seats when they get when they get back to them after the break or whatever it is. And I'd love it if somebody before the break would say, "Hey, Carter Smith's going to be coming to talk about us talk, talk about gangs in the military." Before he starts talking, there's a survey in front of you. We'd really like for you to fill out. And I put all the disclaimers in there and the anonymity and all that other good stuff. And I got to tell you, I'm getting 50 and 60 percent response rates. And I've done this across the nation. I've done this in the northwest, the northeast, the southwest, the southeast and throughout the west. And, the, and, the east. and I got to tell you, pagans are always in the top five. Wow. Not, not you know, always, but often in the top five. The, the, the big ones are always there because. It doesn't matter where they join the military, and it really doesn't matter where they are now. It matters where they're going to be after that. And those might be three totally different places, especially if they're in one of those organized crime groups. And the leader says, we know you joined in Honolulu. We know you served mostly on the West Coast. We need you in Baltimore. What are they going to say? do? Say no? I don't think so. You know, Dr. Yeah. Smith, it's, it, again, my, my memory is being jogged all over the place in this episode. I do. But, uh, you know, there was, I, I mentioned all these shootings and all this uh, tension uh, with the pagans and other groups. There was someone, uh, there was a shooting right in your backyard. I don't know if you're aware of it uh, in, Nash, in Nashville, maybe not backyard, but close to your backyard, maybe. Uh, largest city, no, largest city to me. How about that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> about a month ago. Um, there was a shootout between uh, pagan pagans and outlaws in yeah. the uh, parking lot uh, of a bar in Nashville, and both a pagan and an outlaw were killed. So th it just shows you how <laughs> serious this pagan expansion effort is getting, yeah. where there's been three, I think there have been three shootings, two murders, another handful of beatings, all in the last year or two, all in areas that the pagans had never been in before right yeah i mean one thing i want to ask is you were talking about so you're talking you're talking about this war going on and and you know then we mentioned transferable skills one thing that i think researchers are concerned about the transferable skills when you have military training and now you're part of a gang or an outlaw motorcycle club and and you're involved in an actual war with another group and you're trying to take territory that um if if members of these gr gangs or groups have specialized military training um can recognize trade craft th th this is very <laughs> dangerous for law enforcement right so can you talk to us about that carter like those transferable skills and especially oh, yeah. when they're but, when they're doing reconnaissance and, and and an actual shooting war um it seems pretty dangerous atmosphere yeah i most everybody and when i drop I, whenever i say military trained gang members if somebody said what you, what's your primary research topic i say military trained gang members and then I, I'm silent for a few for a few seconds so they can process that just for just for, you know, because it's, yeah. it's a usual. And then what I tell them is and I'm not concerned with them learning how to shoot a gun. Because I could teach anybody how to shoot a gun in about a minute, especially if they were under fire. In fact, I wouldn't have to teach them. <laughs> I just right. put, point it and push that button. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's if that, <laughs> right. So it's not about the guns. It's about leadership. It's mm -hmm. about psychological operations. It's about logistics, for Pete's sakes. You want drug running going on? How about we make you a logistician? That's a cool word. That means you could work for Walmart or the gangster disciples, right? <laughs> right. How, how, about, how about security? How about, how about signals? How about communication? How about 
any any there's any skill set that these folks have. In fact, the further away from the gun shooting, the better, because everybody in the military learns how to shoot a gun. It's not a primary job. Yeah. Enforcers are easy certain. to find if you're uh, an organized crime group. It's the yeah. the tacticians and the logicians and the right. the well, people my, that are the leaders that need, like he's saying, business skills. Yeah. Right. Not just gangster right. skills. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We don't want tats and we don't want you to, to, to talk like you're a third grader and didn't learn proper English. We want you to show like you are CEO material and then we'll introduce you to ours and he'll put you where he wants you because this is a business. This is not a group of young boys who were fatherless, who didn't get enough hugs in their life. This is a bunch of people who have chosen this lifestyle. There's a uh, there's a fellow named Sadir Venkatesh. He left Berkeley of all yeah. places, went to Chicago, where he embedded with the Gangster Disciples for a while. Yeah. Sadir Venkatesh uh, was he was a known so he was a sociologist and he was known not to be a gangster disciple, but they opened up to him. <clears throat> and the leader of the gang was a fellow with a bachelor's in business administration. And I'll never forget reading Bell. "Gang Leader for a Day," and the the guy said, can't remember his name right now. Anyway, um, he said, I, I got into corporate America with my, business, with my business degree, and I realized there was a ceiling for me, too. And I thought, you know what? I can make multiples of this amount of money, and all I got to do is duck a couple bullets and bury a couple of homies once in a while. I'm out of here. And he went back and led a very large faction of the Gangster Disciples. You know, that's the decision you got to make. What do you, what do you, it's a decision we all make. What am I willing to do for the amount of money I'm going to make? You know, in the biker Basically, gang, in the biker gang world, we're really at ground zero for that shift in mindset because you can yes. you can tie it all back to Taco Bowman, who was you know is even though he's he's passed away uh, the most um, notorious American biker boss not named Sonny Barger. Right. Uh, Taco right. built the Outlaws into what they are now was a Detroiter, but Taco was, dare I say, the first biker boss in America to cut the hair, uh, cover the tattoos, yep. wear a suit and tie, and present himself as a, you know, he called himself a chameleon. And yep. he could be just as rowdy and crass and outlawed out, as possible when he was with the outlaws, but when he was doing business on behalf of the outlaws with other people, he didn't, he, he, he metamorphosized. Yeah. Right. What a concept. Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, catch on. And, and I will say though, based on, we, we've had some, uh, you know, major players in the outlaw biker world on our podcast. And, um, based on my conversations with them, there is still a tension. My understanding between, some of the OGs who they don't like this. Some of the yes. guys that have been around for a while, they're like, no, we're supposed to be hell raisers, tatted out, right. breaking beer right. bottles over people's heads. And they're and they're not they're not really down with this sort of buttoned up. <laughs> Let's be like well, uh, well, Cone, look at Cone, look at Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. Uh the 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 biker boss we've been talking about who was leading the pagans for the last four years and is now serving a short prison sentence. And I assume when he comes out in a year or so he'll reassume his his mantle of power but you know uh, conan the barbarian looks something out of central casting they call right. him conan the barbarian because he, he looks, looks like because he look like conan the barbarian <laughs> right right well but the street gangs larger street gangs in larger cities or maybe not so large cities are going through the similar kind of tension when the ogs go to prison for 10 15 20 years the gang doesn't die the second in command takeover, and they they put their stamp on it. It's like the second generation of a family business. Yep. And when mom, dad, grandma, or whoever says, "Oh, that's not how we used to do it," no, it's not, and it's working. How about that? Should have done this 15 years ago. It's the same kind of stuff because they realize they're a business. They realize they've been handed the keys to the business, not a tradition, not how we always used to do it. And that's the that's the mindset that makes them be able to transition from old school to new school and, and, and do all the interactions that are required of any organization in the 21st century for success. Yeah. I'd like to ask you while we still have you, um, I know we're getting close to finishing up, but 
the national security implications of this, because since we're talking about outlaw bikers, after you know, I did the training with you in Chicago, this is when I was still on Arizona. So I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but I did some field research in San Diego and mm-hmm. I was talking with the, the gang unit there and the SDPD, but then also the military police with the U.S. Navy. So San, San, Diego, Diego. San Diego has, a, just for people that don't know, yeah. San Diego has a huge military population. Yeah, yes, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So you have Marines. And they're close to Mexico. Well, that, that's where I'm going with this. So they both told me, I was asking them, okay, what, what's going on in San Diego? And they both told me that their biggest concern right now are Hells Angels in the military and that there's evidence that they were stealing weapons from the armory and selling them to the cartels, cartels. in, in oh, Tijuana. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could comment on on that, like the national security. I mean, that seems like a, that doesn't seem well, good, right? <laughs> Captain no, Obvious here. And- Every every one of the large street gangs and every one of the large outlaw motorcycle gangs has been identified as being affiliated with several of the DTOs, the drug trafficking organizations in Mexico. And they have affiliations just like People Nation, just like blood, you know, all that good stuff. Right. And and the amazing thing is nobody saw this coming. What are you smoking to where you're you're so zoned out, you know? You can't war gain this thing and realize that these are not dumbass criminals uh, off off on the weekend because they can't find a job that isn't better than McDonald's. These folks made a conscious decision to get into a business that they could make lots and lots of money at and have freedom and 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 uh, autonomy and all that good stuff. And so, yeah, there's there's been indicators that military folks have been selling weapons and property, and that's one of one of the things I ask in my survey. Uh, do they? Tactics, weapons, and property are being are being used, incorporated into the gang life by the military. And it's funny because the tactics they usually say not so much. But I said, okay, how many bank robberies? Because if that's not a military tactic, I don't know what is. Yeah, right. But in the grand scheme of things, weapons could weapons are the hardest to get out of the military unless there's a war. Um, and, and, but, it, but we're not talking about our weapons when we confis- when we soldiers, military, whatever, when we confiscate weapons, do we really think they all get confiscated? Cause if I get a couple of Soviet made weapons or a couple of Israeli, whatever, wherever they are German made and they aren't in the books for my arms room, I'm not accountable for them, but I sure enough got a place for them. Cause I'm in charge of the armor. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's not hard. That's, Every single time, that's been a problem. That's yeah, of course they're getting it, and and that's that's what makes the media uh, go crazy. Oh, they're selling weapons. That's not the biggest thing, y'all. I, hell, the ATF sold them weapons. So it, this yeah. is just that they have that, and they have bullets, and they have training, and all these other things. The military has gotten very famous for minimizing the problem, and I understand that because they got bigger fish to fry. To be honest, and. They aren't inclined to listen to somebody who is no longer in the military, and they didn't listen to me much when I was in about how to fix the problem. It's not easy. You got to be a jerk. Sorry. No, you can't come in. I don't care if you need a second, third, fourth, and fifth chance. No, you can't. Oh, you want a polygraph test? Sure, we'll hook you up every year. You, we're going to roll video. I want you to flip off your OG. We'll hold it until you backstab us. Then wow. we'll send it to him. What do you think about that? Barring that, I don't see a way for a former gangster to come in the military, just saying. But I do know that their loyalty will never be challenged and it will never be supported by the military or never, never, it'll never support the military. And if it does, I think you might be missing something. I think you might be blinded by something. The loyalty to the, yeah, the loyalty to the club will exceed loyalty to your, to your country. Yeah, and I think that's long. yeah, and that's a national security issue. And I, and I remember you in the you know the classes that I took with you that um, when when guys on the ground, investigators like you at, at, on the ground level, were trying to raise these issues, it seemed like the brass just uh, was was not interested in that, in that kind of intel. Be, what to do to about be on, to be fair though, and I, I I think I may have said this. To be fair, that's understandable. That's a leadership challenge. It also works in relationships. Again, one of the things I tell my students, no one likes to be confronted with a problem without a corresponding solution. Right. So if you go to your supervisor or your boss or your peer or whatever, and you say, hey, such and such is broke, 
They say, no, it isn't. <laughs> you say, I think this might have a problem. I either fixed it already or better than that. Here's what worked the last time I saw the other guy uh, uh, have this problem. They're going to say, oh, maybe there is something I can do about this. There's a, a story I tell about Lieutenant Colonel X. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel X got a call from me. Uh, I said, hey, like I did all the time. I said, Colonel, Colonel X, this is Carter Smith, Army CID. Oh, was some way the way I said Carter, the secretary thought I said Colonel. Um, I'm not sure why that was. <laughs> uh, this is Carter Smith, Army CID. I'd like to schedule a gang and extremist group briefing for your unit, uh, preferably the NCOs and officers. Uh, and uh, it'll take maybe an hour. It could take more if there's a bunch of questions, but we typically try to wrap it up in an hour. Um, and we, we have done it for everything from half a dozen to, to, to a couple hundred, depending on the interest. And he said, well, Agent Smith, thank you for calling. He said, we don't have a gang problem in my unit. I said, well, I realize that, sir, but that unit next to you, they're ate up with that stuff. I pulled out all the punches. And, and we're afraid that might rub off. So we wanted to take some preventive maintenance checks. Um, thank you, Agent Smith, for your time. I, we really don't have that problem. And I knew, I knew better. I, we had some undercover operations that were involving his unit. And I knew we'd be talking to him in a, in a month or so. And, hey, we just wrapped up this thing. But I reached out to a couple guys that I know, one of them in Tennessee Department of Corrections and then the other in Michigan Department of Corrections. And I said, guys, what, do I, what, do I, what am I doing wrong? And they said, I don't know. How do you do this? And I said, well, this, I make this phone call. I was, I was never in sales before the Army. I was in sales after the Army. <laughs> but, but I was never in sales before the Army because I just, here's a problem. And if you ain't smart enough to figure out it's a problem, you need somebody's help. It may or may not be mine, but I can't help you. And that's kind of where I was, but I, this bothered me more than that. And I told him I like to give a gang and extremist group briefing. He said, that's the problem. And I said, why? He said, because they can, in their mind, they think, you're telling me there's a problem in my unit. You want to offer me some stuff I never heard of. And let's just be honest. We were talking about middle-aged white guys. I'm a middle-aged white guy. Do you realize that most of the leadership in the military looks like me, or at least did 20 years ago, talks like me, walks like me, and acts like me. Any middle-aged white guy on this, in this country, maybe not on this planet, but in this country, I say the word gang, and many other people who aren't middle-aged white guys, but they don't have this problem that I'm, I'm going to identify. I say the word gang. Tell me about the picture that just popped into your head. Bloods and Crips. I be... want you to identify a human, and I want you to describe him. It's good. They're going to think a person of color. Yeah, that's what they're going to think. Minority. Yeah. He's either black or Hispanic. Let's right. be real. Yeah. Right. right? And and a, and a, and, a, and a, this is before wokeness, and a and a and a, a trustworthy or dependable or self-evaluating middle-aged white guy back in the '90s would think, "Shit, I'm a racist." Yeah. I just, I mean, they just used a four-letter word that wasn't offensive, and I instantly stereotyped. Damn. Well, what they didn't realize is I didn't say outlaw motorcycle gang or you'd have thought about a guy just like you. Right. right? That's that's my that's my theory. I, I haven't been able to unprove it, but I haven't had anybody challenge me on it. So as you're going through that thought process, both my both my security threat group coordinator guys said, why don't you call them <gasps> security threat groups? Yeah. All right. Right. Oh, oh, I like that. Yeah. So. I called that same colonel. Now, why did I call the colonel? Because if I called the lieutenant or the training officer or two, they'd be they'd be saying, well, I got to check with my colonel. So I just call and ask for the colonel. Colonel X, this is Carter Smith, Army CID. He says, well, let me just hold. Stop. You called me just a couple weeks ago. I said, I know, Colonel X. I said, I need to prepare a security threat group briefing for your unit. He said, oh, well, hang on a second. Sergeant <laughs> Jones, his training NCO. Sergeant Jones, come down here a second. Bring the calendar. What are we doing Thursday? Some mandatory training. Cancel it. How about Thursday at 1, Agent Smith? Um, yeah, that, that would work for me, sir. Uh, can I ask how many should be in attendance and where you want to host it? We're going to have it at the, at the Man Theater. It's a large theater. We're going to have all my soldiers, every stinking one of them. Mm. Really? Okay, I'll see you there. It's on my calendar. I cornered him. Not really. You don't corner a colonel in the army. But I, 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 call, I, I stepped aside with him. I said, you do know I'm the one that called you, right? Before that, with a gang. He said, yeah. I said, what's the difference? He said, you called it the right thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Security threat group is a self-defining term. Yeah. 
And, and all of a sudden, I don't feel like I can't fix it because I know you're identifying something that's been around for decades and centuries. And you're not going to blame me for it. It's not my fault that you have numbers to report. And, and, and. So that yeah. was the strategy that we used. I, I know you can't do it. I know you can't call them a community threat group because well, I don't know why you can't. But I, apparently you can't because I've been, I've, been I've been singing that song for a decade now. Um, but whatever you call it, you got to identify it as a problem. And, and I, I referred to poison and, and dog manure before. I, I have people poo-poo the, the numbers of gangs. Some people will tell you there's about 2% of the community is a gang member. Now, it's larger in some than, than it is in others, whatever, 2%. I don't care if it's less than 1%. I'm going to give you a sandwich with less than 1% of the content is dog crap. <laughs> are you How eat much it? of that sandwich are you eating? <laughs> right. I'll give you a, I'll give you a, y'all have a, 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 what's the drive-in uh, uh, place that has slushes or whatever. Anyway, you you're going into you're going into a restaurant and you order the biggest milkshake in there. It only has less than one percent cyanide in it. How much of that are you drinking? Mm, yeah. How thirsty? It doesn't matter how thirsty. I'm drinking tap water. Thank you very much. Right? Gangs are the same way. Because here's where the problem is. The problem is not when they're in the military, where less than one percent of my people are gangsters. No, that's less than one percent that you know about. There's a lot more than that because they're smarter than you. But here's the problem. Everybody in the, in two places gets out. Corrections and the military. They aren't in for, well, most of them aren't in for life. Definitely not the military. And there are way more veterans than there are active duty military. And if numerically speaking, those veterans overwhelmingly uh, uh, stay out of the military, they're no longer the military's problem. Now they're the community's problem. And they've identified themselves as gang members and they're not catchable because, hell, they've hid from the military. And now they've been experienced and they aren't the ones committing the crimes and they're removed from the criminal activity. And, and, and you've just got a bunch of folks involved in organized crime. And it, that military connection is long ago, but that's what started it. Sorry. Yeah. And if and I, I'd like to ask you one last thing, because I think it, it would, it's too important for us to ignore because it's such a prominent issue right now which is the, the extremist group. And, and um, you know, th that's something, you know, I'm not sure, you know, conceptually we could talk about, should they be lumped in with gangs and organized crime? But I tell my students that, well, the DOJ, th they do, that's what they're doing. So we're going to talk about extremist groups in the course, um, even though they don't, they don't seem to line up exactly with some of these other groups, but, but DOJ, FBI, so, they, know, to they, me, they definitely put them in the same right. category. And, and I'm not going to disagree with, DOJ because they have their reasons. Yeah. For me, when people ask me how I define organized crime, for me, it, it has to be entrepreneurial. Right. And I don't see these extremist, these extremist groups are very ideolog ideological. Yeah. No, right, right. But so, I don't think they really care about making money. They care about causing chaos. Yeah. So I, I, I understand the, but, but I think that's for us as like social scientists, right. we can, we can have that academic debate, but the, the fact is they, they are lumped in, at least from the perspective of law enforcement. So right. I, my understanding is that we're, we see with a lot of the extremist groups that a lot of these members are either active military or, or former military. And so just, just we could get your thoughts on that before we wrap up. Uh, again, the military is a microcosm of society. The Army has, go, well, all the military, but the Army especially has gone all the way to one side. And the pendulum swinging now that we have an African-American uh, Secretary of Defense uh, we had an African-American secretary of the Army in 95, uh, and he didn't fix it. So I don't think the SECDEF's got much more of a chance. Uh, because the African-American secretary of the Army, Togo West, sent out hundreds of people to conduct thousands of surveys about whether there was an extremist group problem. Because a fellow named Burmeister and two of his minions in Fort Bragg literally assassinated a, an African-American couple in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And he said, holy crap, we've got a problem. Let's see how big it is. And while the people that were tasked with going out to find whether there was a domestic terrorist extremist, I'll tell you why I use that term in a minute, why there was this, this activity that nobody knew about, they knew about it. They knew about it at Fort Bragg. They didn't have a solution. Therefore, there must not be a problem. They went around the army and conducted thousands of interviews. And they came back and they said, yeah, there's a bit of a problem with domestic terrorist extremists. It's less than 10% of the street gangs, though. 
You better pay attention to the criminal street gangs because they're all they will bite you in the butt if you don't. And you know what? The reports that, that are being generated nowadays, it's a 10 to 1 on a bad day odds. Are they any more dangerous? I don't know. They, the military has tried really hard. And to your point about not, not being tracked, I think the reason the domestic terrorist extremists, I use that term because they call them domestic extremists in the military, but there's no definition. It says see domestic terrorist. Yeah. Hello? So terrorist is the word I use in the middle, and I just swipe it all the way through. That way, if your search engine optimization finds it, it's going to find one or the other. Right. So DTEs is what I call them. What, what you're going to find is that these groups aren't going away. What you're going to find, I had a reporter ask me, which is more dangerous, them or the street gangs? I said, now or in the future? <laughs> right. right now, I'm more scared of the street gangs. But in the future, if these guys, domestic terrorists are just like international terrorists. They don't think in terms of minutes and weeks and months. They think think in terms of years, decades, and lifetimes and generations. Yeah, the and they will play. wait. And it's like can a camera all over again when you least suspect it. Here it comes your way. So yeah, I they have and and yeah, they they they've got the ideological thing. It's it's very religious in nature. I don't mean to offend anybody who's religious, but and and I'm. I would be considered religious. I'm a Christian. I don't consider that religious because I think religious religious is 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 an is a habit that can lead to things getting out of hand, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but but it's that it's that deep commitment that these guys get that can be unexplainable to many folks if they don't get it. Um, and so, yeah, I yeah I don't know where else to go with that. Yeah, well, it, we'll we'll see. Um, it, it at least it's getting reported on more so than, like we've talked about the street gang problem in the military. It seems like that doesn't get reported. That's underreported. At least this is generating some attention. So I, I don't know if the policymakers will this year. Yeah, but, do but, anything. But, 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 but if you've been paying attention to to what yeah, happened year, in right, the state yeah. of Michigan with yeah. our governor, you know, you, you got to worry about both sides of the law on this. Yep. You know, the yep. the governor uh, of Michigan for people that might not know. Uh, Gretchen Whitmer, she was uh, very uh, COVID conscious at the beginning of at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. It, it upset a lot of far right winger extremist groups, and they plotted a kidnapping and murder. Now, I believe eighteen of the twenty people in the conspiracy were acquitted. Hmm. Uh, two, I believe, pled guilty. But the 18 that were acquitted were acquitted on the grounds that the FBI had something like out of the 20 people indicted, 14 of them were cooperators. So yeah. it was in, it was it was blatant entrapment. They knew that the, they could have stopped it from Jump Street. Well, well the, speak, yeah. Speak yeah, go ahead. The FBI, the, the, the problem, the reason everybody in the, in the government is so damn paranoid about domestic terrorist extremists is because when the when the weather underground was in play. And the feds trounced their rights so badly that none of them could be convicted for anything, not even jaywalking, so much so that one of them is still in power in Chicago so people can bitch about him going to the White House. It's like, really? Y'all dropped the ball on that a long time ago. But as a result of that, and then Senator McCarthy and his game playing, they are so paranoid about keeping a list of organizations that do... We've even got feds that are so scared, they can't even identify the name of the group. It's like, really? No, how about this? These are all the players in this organization, and it's a criminal conspiracy. It's a streak. It's a whatever it is. Stop. It well, hasn't gone to court. Doc, Dr. Yet. Smith, the, the, the group that they traced this kidnapping assassination plot to had ties and roots with uh, Nichols and, and Kaczynski and McVeigh. Oh no I doubt. Mean, yeah. yeah. No, all I'm saying it was it was just it, it was discovered in the investigation that this was an offshoot of that group that had been operating in the nineties. Yep. The Unibomber yeah, he wasn't gone. he wasn't maybe I'm confusing he wasn't uh, he wasn't affiliated with McVeigh Okay, and I, I apologize. I'm I'm confusing Kaczynski with McVeigh and Nichols. Yeah, McVeigh and Nichols were, were yeah. associated. I'm confusing them because Kaczynski had ties to the state of Michigan. He went to the University right. of Michigan. He was uh, eco yeah. uh, right, right, right. He was uh, Unibomber. Yeah. That's different. And he was he on his own. Larry Hoover now, isn't he? Uh, I yeah I think he is yeah and he El, is. is an El Chapo yes. there too yes. I, I, yeah it's quite a motley crew <laughs> well it's the worst of the worst in the yeah. federal prison yeah. system 
Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we thank you for your time and we appreciate your patience. I know it took a little bit longer because of technological yeah. issues to, to record, but well, we, we appreciate it. Uh, you want to uh, give a shout out to any, you know, where people want to find out more, they want to read your book, find out about your research. Do you have a website or something you want to share with our audience? Yeah, sure. I got I'm at gangsandthemilitary.com, or if you mess that up, it's gangsandthemilitary.com. I got both of them. Um, but I also, uh, and the one, the book that you have there, Gangs and Organized Crime, that's the one that's the most, that's a good reference manual. We actually wrote that not just for teaching, but also for reference. Most police departments will never come across the volume of information that my friend Greg Edder out of central Missouri uh, put together with well, the Russians and tell Greg a lot of the other mafias and all the other authors of this. I met Greg in Chicago. He's really cool. He's yeah. really smart, dude. Please, really fun to talk please, to. Please pass on, uh. My thank yous to Mr. Edder and Mr. Knox and yourself. You uh, cite my work in this in, in your book. I see two articles yeah. I wrote <laughs> that are cited. Uh, my deal. work on uh, Iraqi or uh, my, my research on, Ara on Iraqi organized crime. Um, so you know, I, I just went into I went to the page where we referenced it, and you actually pulled out some of my uh, articles and put it in there. So I, I appreciate That's that. True. And I was actually with. One of the people that you reference in the book uh, last yesterday for a barbecue. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, it's what I what well, it depends. Learned, it depends with this guy if you're on his good side or yeah, your bad I'm not, side. I'm not sure if that's J a good thing. Yeah, Jimmy stays away from these I guys. Stay, I stay away from them. But sure I go good. right into the eye of the storm. <laughs> like, like I told you about how I got involved in, in uh, investigating gangs in the military in the first place. It just happened to cross it, but that's. I think the more we find people who have a, who generate an interest based on a chance encounter, it's all about sharing information. It's all about teaching what you're learning while you're learning it. I was talking to a group of experts, uh, identified experts the other day, and that's what I said. I said, I, I don't, we can all say we're not an expert. We can all say we are an expert. It doesn't matter. If you're not sharing what you're learning while you're learning it, you ain't doing nothing for me. So you don't mean nothing. You, you're not an expert in that arena. So. We nobody's the be all and end all unless they're creating it, right? Then we're all reporting anyway. And so you can be you can hide all you can hide what you're finding or you can share what you're finding. And I think there's more value in sharing it. So yeah, I um, think so. Well, thanks yeah. again uh, for for joining us. And I, I I'd like to talk to you for a second off off air if sure. you, if you can hold on. But sure. thanks for everyone listening. Please follow us on social media, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube at Gangster Podcast. Uh, subscribe, like us. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. We're out.